coming up, Forest Blazes in 2023 released more than 400 megatons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. But what does it mean for the planet? And do we have any control over annual wildfire seasons? The fact that we've seen almost continuous fires, this is really something that um, is highly unusual. After years of campaigning, students at New York University finally convinced the school's board to halt investment in fossil fuel companies. But to have this decision be made in spite of their presence in the room is, is very fulfilling for me. And the UN's environmental policy comes under media scrutiny. An investigation reveals the Climate Authority may be turning a blind eye to the failures of its carbon offset system. Does it mean, based on what your investigation reports, that we can no longer trust the UN, what it says or does to slow global warming? Well, that, yeah, that's also a very good question. This is just two degrees on TRT World. The Danish shipping company Maersk has been decreasing its greenhouse gas emissions. According to Statista, that's a market research company, Maersk's GHG emissions declined steadily between 2017 and 2022. And to keep in line with its climate goals, the company unveiled the world's first container that's fueled by green methanol. Just to be clear, most of the methanol produced today comes from fossil fuels, mostly natural gas. But the new vessel is powered by green methanol, which is a low carbon fuel that's made from either biomass or renewable electricity and captured carbon dioxide. Reports are the ship will emit 100 tons of CO2 less per day compared with diesel-based ships. The shipping industry as a whole accounts for around 3% of global emissions, and there are reportedly 100 of the methanol-powered container ships on order. This event is a big deal, not only for Europe, but for the whole world. As you said, 90% of the world trade is carried by sea. International shipping represents 3% of the global greenhouse gas emissions. By successfully decarbonizing shipping, we're not only promoting our fight against climate change, we're also creating new supply chains, new industries, and thousands of new good jobs. To successfully transition away from fossil fuels, we must jointly address the next big challenge, and that is to enable and scale the world's supply of green fuels. And let me just illustrate the magnitude of this challenge. By 2030, Maersk alone needs approximately 5 million tons of green fuels. According to the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service, which monitors global wildfire carbon emissions, it has been a record wildfire season which runs from May to October. The biggest wildfires in Canada were first detected in May. They were so widespread and intense that they contributed total estimated carbon emissions of almost 410 megatons for this year alone, breaking the previous 2014 record of 138 megatons. They made up nearly a third of all global wildfire carbon emissions for 2023. Another significant wildfires that took place were in Russia, northern and central Greece, Portugal, Spain and Hawaii. This has been... Uh an extraordinarily difficult summer for so many Canadians from coast to coast to coast as communities have been hit with wildfires, with extreme weather events, uh, on top of all the other economic challenges people are facing. Significant wildfires have caused significant damage like we've never seen before, not only throughout the Hawaiian Islands in the United States, but in Canada and other parts of the world. We've never seen this much fire. And here to speak with us from Bonn, Germany, about the wildfires is a senior scientist from the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service, Mark Parrington. Hi there, Mark. It's really good to see you. Uh, unfortunately, not under better circumstances. Um, what exactly about these, these wildfires made 2023 such a record year? Well, um, the report that we put out or the, the review that we put out of the summer months is something we've done most years, the last few years. And, and generally in the summer months, we expect to see forest fires around the Northern Hemisphere, at boreal latitudes in North America and Siberia and, and, and in Europe. However, what we've seen this year in Canada is something that we haven't observed before and is something that's, that's highly unusual. Um, 
the typical fire season is from May to October, or you can still see fires in late April and, and in September. That's not so unusual either. But the fact that we've seen almost continuous fires in some part of Canada since the beginning of May up till now, and with the latest satellite imagery still showing fires burning in Northwest Territories and British Columbia, um, this is really something that um, is highly unusual. Mark, before I get to the amount of carbon dioxide that was released, why are wildfires so destructive and so difficult to put out? Well, it, it's always a bit more complicated than that. In some forests, in some habitats, fire is a, is a part of that, a natural part of the ecosystem. And there are plants and animals that have adapted to, to living with fire. But that's not the case everywhere. Um, we see that these fires, particularly with climate change, with hotter and drier conditions, leading to higher fire risk and higher fire danger means bigger fires, more persistent fires, as we've been monitoring. Um, as those approach population centers, they pose obviously risk to life and to property. The smoke that they generate can be very harmful to human health. And so there's severely degraded air quality, which also has an impact. Um, and th those are the main reasons why, why we're concerned. And this is one of the main reasons why we monitor fires around the world and their emissions and, and see what that means potentially for air pollution. Mark, you mentioned the wildfires, many of them are an annual event. We get this question a lot. Are there, are there just more of them or is there just an air of climate sensitivity right now? I think maybe it's a, a couple of things. What we've seen this year, a lot of these fires and a lot of the emissions coming from Northwest Territories. And so this is very high latitude. Um, it's a place which is quite remote in, in a lot of places as well. Um, and uh, the reason why a lot of fires have been burning there were because the environmental conditions have been providing the ideal fuel state, the vegetation state to, to burn in this way. So generally warmer temperatures and warmer winds when there's been an ignition, but also much drier conditions leading to increased flammability, increased fire risk. And I think it seems in this case um, that that's led to more and more fires over over this large area mm. and that but also intense fires and that contributes then to these uh these increased emissions right. so according to your report mark the amount of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere this year was around 410 megatons three times the last record back in 2014 which was around 138 i believe the number was um can you help us quantify these megatons of carbon what does that mean exactly for the planet yeah, so actually maybe just to clarify that, that 400 megatons is actually total carbon. If we convert that into a carbon dioxide equivalent, it's about 1,500 megatons. But the, the relative difference over the previous years relative to other years and other seasons will be comparative to what we're seeing with the relative change in the carbon emissions too. So on the one hand, it still remains to be seen how much of that carbon and CO2 will stay in the atmosphere, but for the air pollutants, those emissions do generally stay more in the environment so they can affect air pollution, as I said, but also water pollution and water quality. Mm. Where are you seeing most of this air pollution across the globe, Mark? So for the last few months, it's been mostly from those fires in Canada. So and it's very clear in the monitoring we do, we're using satellite observations to look at particles in the atmosphere or carbon monoxide, which is a, a product of the combustion and is something that's quite well observed by satellites and a very good tracer of pollution and where it goes. And so we've seen this very persistent high values of smoke and air pollution coming in from fires in Canada that's moved from west to east a little bit of, of, from week to week. Uh, but generally, that's been the persistent, persistent place. Some of the fires that occurred in the far east of Russia have been much less than we've seen in previous years, but they also produce a lot of smoke and we've seen that go as far as the mm -hmm. Arctic Ocean, the fires, smoke from the fires in Canada crossing the Atlantic Ocean and being detected in, in European air as well. Just to go a bit further on this, Mark, the World Economic Forum just released a reporting that air quality in 2023 has actually gotten better. Um, how do we, does that make sense to you? concerning how much carbon was released into the atmosphere based on the wildfires this year only? 
It, it is a concern, of course, because it is it does severely degrade air quality. So all the mitigation strategies for pollution from industry and traffic and human activities can be offset by significant emissions from from forest fires, um, but also dust storms. Um, and that's one of the keys to why we do the kind of monitoring and provide an oper operational service in the way that we do in the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Service to understand when these fires or dust storms are occurring, what, they, what that means for the, the atmosphere, how they're impacting the atmosphere and ultimately the air that we're breathing. Mark, really nice speaking with you. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Thanks very much. Well, climate activists were arrested after blockading Citibank's global headquarters in New York and clashing with employees. The scuffle was part of a protest over fossil fuel funding. In April, the environmental group Banking on Climate Chaos shared a report claiming Citi was the world's second largest financier of the fossil fuel industry and funded $333 billion worth of projects since the Paris Climate Agreement was signed in 2016. New York University has announced plans to avoid any direct investments in companies whose primary business is the exploration or extraction of coal, oil and gas. The divestment will apply to the biggest 200 fossil fuel companies. Back in 2014, New York University invested $139 million in fossil fuels. I caught up with Holden Lee, one of the students who campaigned to make this happen. He's part of the Sunrise Movement, a group of students pushing for change at NYU. To what extent was New York University investing in fossil fuels in the past? Well, so as with any private university, the actual details of the endowment are a little bit shady, but we've had numbers sporadically throughout the last 10 years, which is when the campaign has been running. And at times, you know, there have been investments up to 200 million. At the present moment, it's kind of hard to say exactly what that was right before they made the decision. And we know that as a result of our campaign, they've kind of been winding down their investments in fossil fuels over the last couple of years. But all we can know for sure is that from here on, it's going to be zero. So. Interesting. So what was the process for you guys that made this divestment announcement happen? Well, for us personally, about three or four years ago, we picked up the reins on kind of a campaign that had been on since 2016. But kind of had fallen by the wayside. Nobody was really taking it up right now. And um, we decided to to relaunch the campaign for divestment at NYU. And first couple of things we did, you know, we just wanted to support sort of having rallies. We had a petition that was really widely circulated, but I think eventually what we were really building to was having a meeting with the board of trustees who are the people who obviously control the exact thing happened late last year. And then I guess we kind of didn't hear anything for a couple of months. You know, we were starting to think maybe it's not working out. And then about a couple of weeks ago, we got a letter from the chair of the board, William F. Berkeley, and that was announcing that the decision had been made. Yeah, speaking of Mr. Berkeley, I think back in 2016, reports are he said the board did not agree that divestment would would cut the university's reliance on fossil fuels and that the decision would be uh, quote unquote disingenuous as they still used on campus. Does the university still rely on oil and gas? Absolutely. I mean, New York University is arguably at times has been the largest private landowner in New York City. So it big, big lofty goal to have them stop using fossil fuels altogether in any of their buildings. And I'm sure they still are. But I, I think that that argument that they posited in the 2016 letter is very self-serving to say, oh, we can't stop investing in fossil fuels because we're still using them because many of us are still using them. Almost anyone on the planet is still benefiting from the use of fossil fuels. So to say that using them alone is sort of a disqualifier from you making any positive changes for the future is kind of a ridiculous argument to me. Well, will there be any changes at all at the university since this announcement? Well, we can hope and we will definitely keep pushing. A lot of us are seniors right now, but we have a great new leadership team coming in and NYU does have a very great sustainability department. And, you know, we're hoping to make positive changes in that direction. This is really just a start. Out of curiosity, Holden, I understand there have been like calls to remove some of um, NYU's board members, well, ones that are closely affiliated to fossil fuels. Is that the student's next mission? I wouldn't want to comment on whether or not we're going to specifically call for the removal of certain members of the board. I couldn't say, but I will say that I think what makes this decision all the more gratifying is knowing that there are people like Maria Bartiromo and Larry Fink, CEO of BlackRock, on the board who are sitting there going on the news saying Maria Bartiromo actually said the real crisis is that investments in fossil fuels are declining. So to have this decision be made in spite of their presence in the room is, is very fulfilling for me. I'll say that.
A scientist traveled to Greenland's Scoresby Fjord to observe an entire ecosystem at risk. Why? Well, because the Arctic region is warming four times faster than the rest of the world. And the warmest ever July was recorded there this year. An entire ecosystem was at risk of disappearing for good. The fjord researchers went to is largely unstudied. Time is of the essence, though the entrance to the fjord normally freezes shut in mid-September and stays that way for 11 months of the year. I'm fundamentally sad, like all my colleagues. The scientists have in them this immense tristesse de, 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 de la conscience de ce qui se passe. When it comes to climate change, the UN has long called for urgent solutions. And it's reported itself as at least 95% carbon neutral for the last five years, largely through the use of carbon credits to offset emissions. Well, a new collaborative report by environmental news agencies, the new humanitarian and Monga Bay, based on a year-long investigation of carbon credits purchased by 33 UN entities worldwide, suggests the UN isn't as carbon neutral as it claims to be. The report found that the UN's carbon credits were linked to environmental damage, displacement, health concerns, and others were deemed worthless by leading climate experts. And we have with us today one of the reporters who worked on the UN climate neutrality investigation, working for the new humanitarian, Jacob Goldberg in Bangkok. Hi there, Jacob, it's good seeing you. I mean, when you think of the UN, you think of the UN as the authority on pretty much everything. What um, in instigated or initiated this investigation into the body itself? My colleagues at The New Humanitarian and I saw the UN's claim of being almost completely climate neutral and thought that's a pretty bold claim. It implies that this very large organization with operations all around the world uh, doesn't have any contribution to climate change, doesn't have any negative climate impact, despite the obvious fact that they use fossil fuels. How could that possibly be true? How could they be climate neutral? The only way that could possibly, that the only way they could claim that is if they use carbon credits. So we decided to look at whether those carbon credits are actually doing what they advertise. Makes sense. Um, talk a bit about carbon credits and carbon offsetting. We get this question a lot. Can you simplify what these two things are? It, it can get very uh, difficult to understand, um, but basically uh, an, an organization that offsets, meaning they buy carbon credits, uh, means that they're paying companies uh, outside of their organization to reduce uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere for them. They calculate how many uh, tons of, car of greenhouse gases that other organiz that other company reduced in the atmosphere, and then they subtract that number from their annual emissions at the end of the year. That sounds complicated, because it, it sounds as though it talks about uh, predictions and projections. How do they come up with the correct amount of money that equals the correct amount of carbon credits? It's really complicated and it varies by the type of project. Um, but one thing we found is that, well, of course, the carbon, cred the carbon credit industry is very diverse. There's all types of players. But what we found is that uh, the UN is paying very, very low prices for their carbon credits. And the experts we spoke to said that that was indicative of low quality carbon credits. Um, and yeah, they said that there's a very strong likelihood that certain types of carbon credits in the UN's portfolio are not achieving the reductions they claim to. Hmm. Can you give an example of where the UN places its funds? Where does it buy or who does it buy carbon credits from and why? So the majority of UN entities that claim to be climate neutral buy their carbon credits from a system called the Clean Development Mechanism, which was uh, designed by uh, negotiating countries during the Kyoto Protocol negotiations. And it was meant to be a mechanism to allow wealthier countries to say that they're uh, doing something to prevent climate change, but without the uh, very costly uh, effort of decarbonizing themselves. So they get, so the UN gets most of their credits from that mechanism, but it includes so many uh, projects that experts say do not reduce the absolute number of uh, emissions in the atmosphere. Um, and another thing we found is that 
they, the UN buys these credits from the Clean Development Mechanism randomly. They don't select the highest quality type of credits. And uh, as a result, a lot of the credits they buy, millions of what we found, worth millions of dollars, uh, are among the lowest quality credits available. Interesting. Um, tell me if I got this right. So, for example, uh, a wealthy country like one in Europe would uh, invest in uh, green energy in a poorer country and use the credit allocation of that poorer country, which does not have huge emissions, uh, to offset that wealthier country's own emissions. Is that correct? That's a, that's a very good question, and uh, uh, it's, it's a good opportunity to explain that. You're right. It's probably good that a green project, like let's say a hydropower dam, mm -hmm. uh, which is an energy source that is uh, not fossil fuel based, it's probably good that it, in some ways it's probably good that it, it exists and it's offering um, a source of energy that's not fossil fuels. But can, can a company or can an organization offset its, emission, its emissions with uh, that project? Experts say no, because uh, large infrastructure projects like wind farms and hydropower dams, they don't require revenue. They generally don't require revenue from carbon credit sales. They are economically viable to begin with. So a company uh, like the UN that is funding that project can't take credit for the emissions that that project uh, uh, achieves. They're, they would have happened anyway. So the absolute amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere remains the same. It's fascinating. Your report reveals all of this work the UN has been doing, particularly we, we hear and see Antonio Guterres all the time talking about what needs to be done to reduce global carbon emissions, yet the UN itself has a really faulty carbon credit system. Does it mean, based on what your investigation reports, that we can no longer trust the UN, um, what it says or does to slow global warming? Well, that, yeah, that's also a very uh, good question. Your shrug says it all. <laughs> the experts we spoke to said that their reliance on um, discredited carbon offsets undermines their leadership on fighting uh, climate change. Uh, the, the UN leads countries in achieving their commitments under the Paris Agreement uh, in their, their targets for decarbonizing. The exact UN entity that oversees the COP meetings every year, that, uh, that convenes the negotiations for the, for the Paris Agreement, they are the same entity that purchases carbon credits for, all, for most other UN entities. And like I said, they do this randomly, indiscriminately. Um, so yeah, I think that's the reason why experts we spoke to said that it does undermine their leadership. Has the UNFCCC responded to your questions for comments? I want to give them credit for supplying a lot of the data that we analyzed to come to these conclusions. Uh, when it came to asking them our final questions um, about the quality of the credits they were buying, they said that they rely on the uh, evaluation uh, standards of the clean development mechanism. And they, there, were, there were many questions that they didn't respond to, particularly those about specific projects, like the, the ones that we found uh, contributed to displacement, deforestation, uh, and health problems in the surrounding communities. What does it tell you that they have not responded to certain questions? Do you get a sense that they're hiding information or that they are probably investigating it themselves? I hope they're investigating it themselves. That, that, that would be very welcome. And um, the special rapporteur on environment and human rights, so that's uh, appointed by the UN, said that if there is such a, an investigation that the results should be made public. Um, but I don't know what to make of the fact that they didn't get back to us on all of our, our questions. Jacob, I'm, I really appreciate the work you've done and, and I'm glad to at least hear the UN works alongside you, at least throughout part of it. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. And before we leave you, an area in Cambodia's southern Kep province was once a rich breeding ground for flower crabs. Five years ago, fishermen would haul in as many as 20 kilograms in a single day. But because of warming waters, the crustaceans' figures are dropping. Catching a few crabs a day is currently all that can be expected. So to protect the species, crab fishermen have been releasing any flower crabs they catch back into the water.
la vivo a pleno.